Do you remember the last time one of your grandparents told you a story? So my grandmother, once winter came around, would always describe this magical scene. Imagine winter, Germany, a small village in the mountains. The snow is waist high. Her brother would take her on a sled to school. It was still dark, and they would ride through the bluish snow. There was just one problem with the story. Who was this brother? My grandmother didn't have a real brother. Actually, my, fam my grandmother didn't have any real family, none that survived. Years later, I found out that she was adopted by a Christian family. The boy with the sled was not her real brother. The village in the mountains was not her real home. So why did she tell me this story? What was she trying to remember? And what was she trying to forget? And why? What I study is stories, not my grandmother's stories, but narratives in the Quran and how they are shaped by memory and forgetting. I basically ask the Quranic text the same questions I would like to ask my grandmother. What is remembered? What is forgotten? And why? So why is the Quranic text the perfect place to explore these kind of questions? The Quran emerged in a civilization at the cusp of oral and written culture. There's an important process in this transformation. You have to narrow down the many oral narratives into one written canon. There are two questions entailed in this process. What is remembered and what is forgotten? Strikingly, the Quran calls itself by three names. Quran means a recitation. It's first of all an oral performance. But it also names itself a book, kitab. So that points to a written text. There's a certain tension between these two names. Strikingly, the third label bridges this gap. The Quran also calls itself dhikr, a remembrance. So in my research, th it is the third label that interests me the most. I focus in my research on one story in the Quran, and this story is about Moses. So yes, just in case you wondered, Moses does appear in the Quran. He's even mentioned 136 times. He is the most prominent prophet. Just for comparison, Muhammad is named four times. So let me tell you a story. I have a short disclaimer. Perhaps it's a bit less dramatic than the Game of Thrones, but dead things do come alive. And if you look closer, there is true potential for a blockbuster. So here it goes. Moses and his attendants set out on a journey to the end of the world. On their way, they lose their lunch, a fish. It miraculously comes to life and swims away. They retrace their steps to a rock by the meeting of the two seas. Instead of their lunch, they encounter a mysterious sage. Moses follows him in the hope of gaining divine knowledge. So there's a problem in this story. Who is this Moses? Have you ever heard this story about him before? What does he do in the Quran with a fish and an attendant at the end of the world? What if I told you that a Greek version of this story was a blockbuster for over a thousand years. The cast was different, mm, the language too, and the director remains unknown. So let me tell you this story. We have the Emperor Alexander, who has conquered all of the known world, but he wants to ex explore unknown territory. He sets out on a quest to the end of the world, the land of darkness. Alexander gets hungry from the long journey and asks his chef to prepare a salted fish. While washing the fish in one of the springs, it comes alive with a wriggle of its salted tail. The cook jumps right after it into the water but cannot catch it again. All wet, he forgets to tell Alexander about the incident. <laughs> 
So let's look at this Arabic version in the Quran, in this Greek story, and ask three questions. What is remembered, what is forgotten, and why? So what is remembered? A journey to the end of the world. A world hero who doesn't want to skip lunch. An absent-minded attendant. And a fish that comes to life. But what is forgotten? Yes, Alexander is replaced by Moses. So why? As always in scholarship, there are many theories. So let me tell you one very popular one. So what happened? The Quran confused Alexander with Moses. How? So, also Alexander appears in the Quran, actually right after our Moses story. There he is called the two-horned one, Dhul-Qarnayn. So how is this connected to Moses? Remember, when Moses descended from Mount Sinai, his face is set of beamed with light. Quran open up, right? So Karen got somehow lost in mistranslation. So Karen got somehow lost in translation. And from the early Middle Ages, we have a lot of depictions of Moses showing him sprouting horns. So what happened here? The two-horned Alexander in the Quran got confused with the horned Moses. So now that I've told you this very elaborate theory, let me tell you, I don't believe a word of it. <laughs> Luckily, I don't have a convincing answer yet for this question. And therefore, I do have a PhD project to work on. <laughs> <laughs> what I do know, though, is how to search for this kind of question. I think in order to explain these kind of changes, we shouldn't look at one isolated problem, like how Alexander became Moses, but rather we have to look at the transformations of this story. We have to look at its textual history. So, the Greek story I just told you was on the New York Times bestseller list for over a thousand years, starting from the fifth century. Of course, it didn't have Moses as its hero, but Alexander the Great. So what happened? A bold case of plagiarism in late antiquity. <laughs> this story is actually a collection, it is part of a collection of stories whose popularity was only matched by the Bible. It's titled the pseudo or the Alexander Romans. As happens with bestsellers today, also 1,500 years ago, they were translated into many languages. So let me show you what we call a stemma. So the Alexander Romans was first composed around the third century. This version is lost, but we have translations of it into Latin and Armenian. Then there are other Greek versions, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, yes. Just like corona variants, you name these variations <laughs> in order of the Greek alphabet. So the last variant was translated further into Syriac. There are some Arabic stories. There's a lot of Persian stories, Hebrew, even Ge'ez, the ancient language of Ethiopia. So most of my time in my th PhD, I kind of spent swinging from these branches. This blue mushroom uh, shapes kind of the and outlines my playground. So I first of all look at the Greek variants, at the Syriac versions, at some Arabic stories, and also the Armenian translation. So all in all, I have to juggle about a dozen different variants in over five languages. So how does this help us to understand what's happening in the Quran? I kind of have to place the Quran on this map, on this atlas of memory and forgetting, and to understand how it relates to the many different versions. So rather than looking at one isolated parameter that changes, like Alexander into Moses, I think we have to look at the whole system and analyze the logic of its changes. We have to dig through the many layers this story has accumulated throughout time. So if you'd ask me what I'm doing, I'd say my field is narrative archaeology. I'm studying the scattered pieces of stories and ask how they were told, 
how they were used, and how they had traveled. So just like my grandmother had her reasons to remember some things, to forget others, so are also stories a product of memory and forgetting. When we look at individual memories, we ask, what are the psychological motivations? Why things are remembered in a certain way? It's a bit different when we talk about texts. There, the memory and forgetting are not located in one single individual, but they are spread across time and texts, across many minds and manuscripts. The reasons for their transformations might be sometimes ideological, sometimes philological, like a scribal error or a mistranslation. So I think we have to triangulate from all these different methods in order to find out what is remembered, what is forgotten, and why. So here's actually something I would like you to try at home. I'd like to invite you to listen carefully to the stories we tell ourselves and ask, what is, why are some things remembered and some things unremembered? Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, I'm Nama from the Technion. Uh, beautiful presentation and very interesting. And I was uh, wondering if you can... Um, uh, I had a question just at the end when listening to you about the difference between uh, narrative archaeology, what is remembered and what is forgotten, and um, personal or individual uh, archaeology, <laughs> psychology, uh, what is remembered and what is forgotten. And, and I was wondering how your field may contribute to our understanding of individual remembering and forgetting. And maybe you have something to say about that. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Naoma, for this question. So we had this uh, question before in the kind of the game, right? What would we be if we weren't... Uh, we didn't choose our field of research. So I think I would have chosen psychology. Unfortunately, I'm not a psychologist, so I have no clue. What's, uh, so I can't really say like, what are, really, what, what are the, the a deep analysis of the psychological reasons why we remember certain things and why we don't. What I can talk about, I can talk about manuscripts. I can talk about scribes and their environments and why they might change something in a certain way. And there, for example, in philology, we often talk about like, how the environment, the textual environment, a text might influence how things are expressed. Like You see a lot of scribal errors, for example, when you have the same beginning in a line. So we kind of jump to something different. And I think this is perhaps also something what's happened in our um, individual memories. Like we kind of go to the things we already know, like we, what we already have seen, and kind of... Uh, try to tackle the present situation with something similar that happened in the past. So. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm Shachar from uh, Tel Aviv University. Um, uh, my question is whether uh, these are, uh, like I, I've heard uh, a few times about like these archetypical stories or myths that are spread across cultures and every time they're associated with a different person. I was wondering if these are the only two examples of this kind of story, or whether other you are aware of other myths of uh, in other cultures with uh, similar kinds of stories. And maybe this, like, w we can like get from it some sense of w what is the intention of telling this specific story about a specific person. I think there are first of all there are two ways of looking at these things. First, we have can look at the very broad field and kind of say, ah, there are similar things happening all over the... I can have find something similar in India. I can find something similar in, in Persia. And, and then kind of see, like from a, from a bird's eyes per perspective, what might be similar. What I'm doing is getting really in the nitty-gritty part of this thing, like kind of to understand why things change. And therefore, Alexander is a perfect example because already in his lifetime, he. Tr he 
kind of traveled all over the known world. So his stories are spread all over. And also he becomes kind of a magnet, like he becomes the center of narrative gravitation, a narrative gravitational field, let's say. And he attracts different stories that are told about different protagonists to him. Just for example, in the Quran, you also have uh, a few bits that are kind of where Salomon is modeled on Alexander. So now you have to understand why. I give you a clue, it has to do with women, but that's for the break. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Thank yeah. you for the great talk. Um, you had a, a great storytelling, and I was wondering, uh, how did you arrive to this field? What is your story? My story? Yeah. Why did you choose that question <laughs> of your research? So I'm a traveler. I uh, have traveled many fields in many countries. Um, I started out with uh, Greek philosophy, like Greek, that was my uh, thing. Um, then I started to study Sanskrit. And uh, then I, uh, I heard a lecture by my current supervisor on the Quran. And I couldn't leave it anymore. Like I, from this lecture, I. I just wanted to study a bit of Arabic, and I, I saw how uh, he kind of listened and analyzed the textual events that we find in the Quran. It was, and it was really fascinating for me. So, so this is a huge part of why I chose in the end to study the Quran. And I especially chose this specific story because it kind of combines many worlds. I try to be more or less or familiar with or which I try to visit. So it goes to Professor Dr. Wiedstum and uh, my curiosity. <laughs> so hi, thank you very much. I also wanted to say that uh, you're a great storyteller. So maybe if you have another career, you should uh, consider that also. And yeah. it was a really wonderful talk. Um, and actually, my, so I had two questions, and one of them was really identical. <laughs> so the other question is, uh, you alluded, you said before that there's also stories about King Solomon in the Quran that are also actually from Alexander. And I was wondering how common is it, like from all the stories in the Quran, how many of them are like actually uh, plagiarized, not just by Ale uh, Alexander the Great, but other stories that were out there. And um, so just curious about that. Um, so I, I would be a, perhaps a bit I thank you for this question. I would be a bit careful about the terminology we are using, because plagiarism, of course, that's it kind of sense, but we always adopt stories, right? And the, the, the Quran tells different versions of stories we already kind of know. And the basic assumption, let's say 100 years ago, is that the, the main kind of um, channel of transmission was through the Bible, through rabbinic literature. Then more and more in the recent years, uh, we have found out that most of the stories actually come from like a Syriac background, the Syriac church that was very present in uh, ancient Arabia. So we have these kind of bulk of stories. So what I'm doing, I'm going one step back, like I'm looking at the Greek material, how it transformed into the Syriac versions, and then how it was adopted by the Quran. So that's kind of the trajectory. So the Quran does, of course, it, it's a huge collection of stories and it adopts many, many, many things. But I think the important question is not just, ah, oh, it has the story from Solomon and there we have Moses, but how it transforms this story, how it adapts this story to fit its ideology, the textual environment. It's a poem in a way, so it ha also has some uh, poetic constraints to match. So these are many questions we shouldn't lose out of sight by just saying, these are other parallels. Thank you. Hi. I don't need to introduce myself, I think. Very interesting. Thank you very much. So my question is regarding, you have three questions, right? What is remembered, what is forgotten, and why? And it seems like the last question, the why, is a political question, right? You mentioned that the reasons can be ideological. And I was wondering if you also going to use some political theories and political literature in your PhD dissertation? So one of the, thank you for this question. So one of the reasons 
why some stories change. It's like oh, one of the theories is also what are the political circumstances. So what you can, for example, see that Alexander was used as a political figure. You can see this already with Byzantine emperors who kind of model themselves according to Alexander. Why? Because Alexander is kind of this, I would describe him as a failed proto-Jesus. Like he kind of conquered the world, didn't quite make it, didn't have, wasn't immortal, and didn't uh, bring redemption. But the, the Byzantine empires, um, they kind of tried to model themselves according to Alexander in order to announce uh, cr the eternal uh, kingdom of Christendom. So here in the Quran, for example, Alexander is taken as a prophet. He's kind of a, a pre-Islamic prophet who goes into different regions of the earth and kind of preaches Quranic principles that were only then, of course, revealed uh, to Muhammad, the prophet. So there are these adaptions, but uh, and they are couched in a certain political environment. But I'm not using, per se, like uh, political theory in order to study these questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's all we have time for. Thank you, Sarah.